This is the most important election of all time. The most important election of our lifetime. I I swore that off, I think, in 2012. But this one may be even more than just more important and the most important in our lifetime. This may be the last real election. Things are going to change so much depending on who wins. What are the stakes of this election? Michael Anton joins us in 60 seconds. This is the Glenn Beck Program. So Jason, he's from Texas. He writes in and says, I have a nine-year-old Great Dane who has a thyroid problem. Up until recently, she would sleep 23 hours out of the day. That was before she tried Rough Greens. Uh, Jason wrote in, I can't believe the difference. She does a happy dance all the way to her bowl. She's so much more active. She even jumped on my shoulders twice last week. Those dogs are amazing. Uh, she hadn't been able to do that in five years. It's an amazing transformation. I want to tell you about Rough Greens. It's not a dog food. It's a supplement that you put on your dog's food. And it has all of the nutrients that your dog needs, but get cooked out of the kibble food when it's being made. Probiotics, antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, omega oils. Just some of the things that your dog needs to live a healthier lifestyle. And they are all things that are in Rough Greens. I brought this to my vet and said, should I feed this to my dog? And she said, she looked at all the ingredients and said, please, this is great. Uh, and the dogs love it. They just love it. Give your dog the Rough Greens 14-day jumpstart bag today, fourteen ninety five. See the difference in your dog in 14 days or less. Just go to roughgreens.com slash Beck, roughgreens.com slash Beck, or call 833-GLEN-33, 833-GLEN-33, roughgreens.com slash Beck. Michael Anton, he was a former national security official in the Trump administration, senior fellow at the Claremont Institute, and he has a new book out called The Stakes, America at the Point of No Return, which is exactly where we are. Michael, welcome to the program. How are you? Thanks for being on. I just I want to mention also my, my, my day job, my primary affiliation is that I'm a lecturer at Hillsdale College at our, ah. at our campus in Washington, D.C. Oh, really, a really good institution to be associated mm -hmm. with. A fine institution, indeed. Okay, so you, um, you are, of course, with this book, you're going to be called uh, crazy conspiracy theory. You're overreacting. It's all of these things. Trust me, I've been called this for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, and... I can't punch a hole in what you're saying is coming because I don't think people really realize the end of America as we know it is here and it's just waiting for November 3rd to see which way we're going to go. Yeah, I'd love to be wrong. I've never more wanted to be wrong. You know, you don't want to put six months of your life into something as grueling as writing a book and then say that you hope your entire thesis is wrong. But, you know, what, what patriotic, decent American wants to be right about the end of your country as you know it? I, I, I certainly don't, but I had to write the book honestly and call it as I saw it. And it's pretty obvious to me, first of all, from having grown up in California and lived in New York, I've seen what happens once voting patterns, demographics, etc., tip a place permanently blue so that there's no effective opposition mm -hmm. and what Democrats and liberals do. And it's very bad. <laughs> Second of all, all you have to do is listen to what they say and watch what they try to do at the national level to get a picture of what they will do when they have, when and if they gain blue dominance coast to coast and essentially turn the USA into a giant California, New York. Um, it's not hard to figure out what they're going to do. All you got to do is look at what they've already done, look at what they're doing now, and look at what they say they want to do. So again, if, if I'm a um, crazy alarmist and it's all, you know, it's all not happening, I'd like to hear a convincing refutation of why they won't do what they're already doing and say they want to do. Okay, so describe uh, America, you know, a year from now, should the Democrats win? Well, look, think about some of the completely radical things on their agenda that they, that they ran on. Um, tearing down existing sections of the wall, right? Not only are they against President Trump's wall, which is still not complete, not because the president doesn't want to build the wall, but because he faces so much internal opposition from the federal government, they want to tear down sections that immediately exist. Joe Biden has said he will amnesty 
uh, every illegal immigrant in the country. And he uses the, the, the fake number 11 million, which we've been hearing for something like 20 years now. How is it that with the porous borders and about a million and a half new entries a year or whatever it is, it's gone down under the Trump administration, the 11, 11 million figures remain static for a couple of decades? That seems unlikely, doesn't it? Well, Yale University put out a study last year, or I think it's actually in late 2018, saying we think the number is more like 22 million, right? We don't know how many illegal immigrants are in the country, but Joe Biden will amnesty them all. And then they will be eligible for family reunification uh, visas for uh, relatives abroad, which is a dumb part of the immigration law that President Trump would like to get rid of, but hasn't been in so-called chain migration, but hasn't been able to do because he, you know, he can't, it's impossible to get any piece of good legislation through Congress. So just in Joe Biden's first term alone, we could see the additional importation of tens of millions of new people, all fast-tracked to citizenship, um, so that they can tip purple states blue and produce an electoral lock for the, for the Democratic Party. Uh, remember the first Democratic debate when they were asked, the 10 candidates were asked, how many of you would extend uh, Medicaid to illegal aliens? Uh, of course, they never would use the phrase illegal alien. They use whatever euphemism they used, mm -hmm. undocumented immigrants or something. All 10 hands went up. So we're going to bankrupt these federal programs designed, however imperfectly designed, to help American citizens by giving, it, uh, by giving the, uh, care away completely free to people who broke the law to come into the country in the first place. I mean, this is just, this, these are just the beginnings of the radicalism of their agenda that I'm convinced they will implement if they get in and take power. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm with you on those things, Michael, but I am more concerned. Um, <laughs> that's a, that's a hard thing to say, but I am more concerned that the silencing of voices, the silencing of our churches, the, um, the silencing of conservatives. I mean, it is, not unusual now to hear people on CNN or whatever saying, you know, conservatives really need to be reeducated. Um, you yeah. know, they, they are they are they are in a very frightening uh, Stalinist kind of path right now. And for the most part, so far, they're doing it through. They're, they've outsourced the silencing of voices, censorship, and, and so on, to private companies, to the social media companies and others. And so you, you guys do this, and the government doesn't necessarily need to do it. Um, I, I, I shudder to think what they will do when they also have complete state power. Look, I think their preference is, yes, we absolutely want a lockdown on what can be said, uh, but we'd prefer not to have to use the government to do it because that can get messy and, you know, there might be court challenges, we might lose, it might be unpopular, but, you know, so far there's been very little pushback on tech censorship and, and complete tech control of speech and thought in this country. And the Dems like it that way because they know that they can count on the tech companies to do exactly what they want them to do. Um, but all of that, all of that will get worse. The, you know, there should be Right now, there should be significant governmental pushback on these tech monopolies, and there isn't any. We know for an absolute fact that the tech companies are overwhelmingly democratic in the voting patterns of their employees and in the donations of their executives. And so when you have a democratic administration in the White House again, I think you'll see these two um, uh, institutions work hand in glove to an even greater extent than they have so far, and that will be disastrous for freedom of speech and freedom of thought. And you mentioned churches. I'm the one thing, another thing that worries me very, very much is the way these lockdowns have taken place. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have a legislative branch for a reason. And if there's a need to change policy because of an emergency, right, we should be working through legislative institutions, whether that's the Congress, whether it's the state legislature, whether it's a city council. But all over the country, we've seen mayors and governors just say, as if they have the power, you can't go outside anymore. Now, that's rule by fiat. I mean, that really is, and they, they call President Trump a fascist and all these kinds of names. Oh, no. What, what is this extra legislative, extra judicial power where an executive without color of law in, in any respect just says, I have gave an order, you now must follow it? I don't know, but that's not the kind of government uh, America is supposed to be, and it's not of the kind that I want to live in. So they are, they, they are making rules up for themselves where you can't, uh, you can't go to church, but you can go out and protest. Uh, right. You know, you can go out and riot, uh, but you can't peacefully protest if you're on the wrong side in some states. Yeah, it seems uh, like the more, I don't I, mean, I hate to use such terminology, but I don't, 
I can't think of any other. It seems kind of like the more destructive a thing is, the more they're willing to tolerate or even encourage it, and the more peaceful and constructive it is, the more they hate it. So they'll shut down all kinds of businesses, but make sure the pot dispensaries stay right. open and liquor stores stay open. Now, why is that? There's a, there, I sense a kind of sinister agenda from what I call in the book the ruling class, that they want as much sort of soul-destroying garbage in the culture as possible because it keeps the population from getting too restive and from noticing their bad governance and maybe fighting back. I mean, so, that, is, that, that's, that was part of the deal with the Weimar Republic. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, why are we legalizing marijuana all over the country? And why are Republican, you know, Republican uh, lawmakers, when they get, go leave Congress, including, including a former Speaker of the House, becoming lobbyists for marijuana, which is a, sub, a substance, whatever you think of it. I mean, it's, it's not conducive to having a constructive life or to, you know, ultimately to the social order. I think it's because they think, you know, well, the more people are just on the couch stoned, then, you know, the less trouble they're going to give us. You talk in the book about a couple of things that I would like you to expand on. Um, Caesarism? Yeah. I- explain. Caesarism is a form of, so it's obviously named after the first Caesar, Julius Caesar, who took over the last remnant of the Roman Republic uh, in about 50 years before the birth of Christ and turned it into a one-man rule state. But it's a particular form of one-man rule. Uh, another way of terming one-man absolute rule is, you know, you could call it an absolute monarchy or you can call it a tyranny, right? But it's a particular form that becomes, uh, in a sense, if not justified, uh, maybe necessitated when the constitutional order is broken and can't go on. Uh, and so you're, you ask me about this. This is in a chapter of the book, Chapter 7, in which I speculate. I basically don't take sides. I don't make recommendations. But I say, if the present ruling arrangement is a thing that can't go on forever, as I think that's po- it's possible, then it'll have to stop. It'll have to break. Well, what will follow it? What will, and I, Caesarism is one of those things that could follow it if, if, if present trends continue, especially without President Trump and his closest allies fighting them. Mm-hmm. I, I think the country as we've known it could break, and then something has to follow. And that Caesarism could, could be one of those things. And Caesarism could emerge from either side. It's easier to imagine Caesarism coming from the blue side or the democratic side, just because they have all of the commanding heights, uh, you know, powerful institutions in America now, except one, the White House, which they're determined to get back this fall. It's, it's harder to imagine a path for a Caesarism of the, of the other side to happen, but not impossible. And I, you know, I give all of the reasons and sort of speculate about how this one might happen or that one might happen, just because I think no one's thinking about these things. Uh, and I, I, I point the finger in particular at conservatives. You know, I'm not going to name names necessarily, but there's a strain of conservative thought which is so in love with the idea of American exceptionalism that it thinks that it, nothing can ever get bad enough for America for America to fundamentally change for the worse. Uh. So human possibilities that have been around since there has been mankind, you know, the fall of republics, tyrannies, civil wars, things like that, we don't even have to think about them in America because they can't happen here anymore. And I think that's foolish. And somebody needed to begin the conversation about, well, what happens if it does get bad enough? And so I I stuck my neck out and did that. So Michael Anton, he's the author of The Stakes. Um, And I want to talk to you about, because I think we're closer to these things, Michael, than most people do. Um, I could see a breakdown on the election. It's already going to happen with with the Democrats saying mail-in votes. It'll be days before we know. That will be a shock to the system. Um, And it will, you know, probably will end that night with Trump being ahead. Then these these ballots will trickle in and trickle in and trickle in, and it will appear as a stealing, even if he even if Trump continues to hold, they are going to say, look how many people are being disenfranchised. They're throwing all these ballots out because the typical number of ballots on mail-in that are thrown out is about 20 percent. And they'll make this into some new scandal. I could see either side standing up and saying, that's not my president. Uh, it's not my pre-. and And secession serious talk of secession where states say i'm not abiding by you because you're out of control i i worried about this too i you know i do go into some of these election issues in the book um i couldn't you know it, it they're so vast and complicated yeah, that i know. write an entire book about how 
you know, to, to do modern election fraud, especially with the way these changes are taking place. So I'm foreseeing exactly the same possibility that you foresee. I mean, the best, you know, it, we probably won't have what we had in 2016, where by about two or three o'clock in the morning, if you were still awake, you knew who the president was going to be, right? It was over. Um, and, and it, you know, days may be optimistic. It could be weeks or months. So I have Dear a section God. in that famous chapter. Well, famous. It's not famous yet, but it might be. Mm-hmm. Uh, chapter 7, in which I say states could secede, and this could happen from the blue left or the red right, depending. Mm-hmm. Um, now, and and I'm, I, I don't necessarily even know that, you know, there's two ways to talk about secession, right? One is actually pulling it off, right? Because you, you, the other is just giving it a try. So what happens if a state just passes, a, a state legislature passes a resolution and says, we've seceded from the United States of America? Well, it's not really accomplished until the issue is settled and both sides agree, yeah, yeah, we're, we're separate countries now. Are the feds going to necessarily accept that? And if they decide that they don't want to accept it, what are they going to do about it? And will what they try to do about it be effective? Um, these are all questions that I think we've barely begun thinking about, much less thinking through. Um, I admit Better hurry. I, don't, I don't resolve any of them in the book because I don't know the answers, but I think I have, I think I have raised all of the questions that we need to be talking about. And if I haven't, I urge people to read what I wrote and, 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 you know, write it up somewhere and say, well, Anton forgot this and he didn't think about this and he didn't think about that. Cause we need to get on this right away. So I tell you, Michael, um, I thank you for doing this from, uh, the point of view from the conservative, uh, right, um, because I do believe the left has already wargamed this years ago. I, well, I, I, yeah, I don't know. They, 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 when you say they wargamed, they wargamed it pretty recently. If I, I'm assuming you saw the leak that they deliberately planted in, I, I can't remember if it was Politico or the New York Times, about a month ago, where they got together and they had a wargame scenario that included secession, and then they deliberately put that out into the press. For, for reasons, you know, we can only speculate about, but they don't, you don't leak something to the press unless you think you're going to benefit from the leak. Mm-hmm. So they must think that they benefit from the leak somehow. And in one of those scenarios um, uh, in which uh, um, President Trump wins, this is, remember, these are Democratic and anti-Trump players playing this game. Trump wins convincingly in the Electoral College, but loses the popular vote, just like 2016. And the Biden campaign refuses to concede and tries to urge um, states where Trump, right. that Trump won to send Biden electors. And from there, uh, the dispute gets to a point where, remember, if, it, if the election gets kicked into the House, it's not the full House that votes. It's the state delegations. Each state has a vote. So even though the Democrats control the House, right. they don't uh, control, uh, they don't control it, uh, right. each state delegation in that sense. So under this scenario, uh, certain states, I think they had California and some others, seceded because they didn't want to live under President Trump. Now, call me crazy, and many people will, <laughs> but I, I have a hard time imagining Red America saying, oh, no, California, please don't go. All right, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, Michael. I, I'm sorry, I have a network break. I've got to stop for the author of The Stakes, my, Michael Anton. Uh, you need to pick this up because we do need to start thinking things through. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, back in just a second. 